Bookcase TV is brought to you in part by Digital Film Academy. Welcome back to Bookcase TV. Um, over the last few months, we have uh, portrayed a lot of different type of writers, given voices to people who normally would not have it, and I'm talking about the minorities. But we also have left out a whole slice of the population, and uh, I'm talking about the social casting. It's what's happening in the last decade of our gays and lesbian rights. Uh, not that our episode today is going to be focused on that, but it's about the different voices. And today we're going to meet a playwright from uh, New York, who talks about coming out of the closet and writing a play about it. Uh, we also meet a thriller writer who is very different because he's a male crime writer, but writes from a female perspective. And finally, uh, we will send our favorite book investigator to interview also an ex-war photographer, a woman with a strong presence who talks about the feminist condition or the feminine condition in this decade and see what it's like for women to be mothers and workers and wives. So let's see what they have to say. So I've been trading you, but not stalking you uh, for, for quite a few years, because I think you had a pretty incredible career so far. You know, the very early start, like my last, most playwrights start to boom in the 50s, you did the opposite way. Yeah. You know? Uh, how do you get that uh, royal court? I'm always mystified. People can get uh, a play so young in, uh, in England. And the culture there supports young playwrights. Yes. In a way that our, our culture doesn't. Um, I was lucky, I think. You know, I, the, the, uh, the right play at the right <laughs> time, I don't know. You know, sometimes I can't believe it happened either. But... Okay. I actually printed out, these are the old days, you know, oh, so I printed out... On paper, you mean? Cop yeah, on paper. <laughs> copies of my plays, probably 20 copies. I had three plays at the time that I'd written and, uh, you know, put them in my, ba my bag. And when I got to London, I went to the, the National and there was a book with all the addresses of the theaters in the bookstore. Mm -hmm. And I went to the post office and, you, you know, wrote... <laughs> wrote out the envelopes and everything. It took a, you know, a couple hours and sent my plays. And then got on a plane, went home. <laughs> and, and bingo, yeah, that was it? Well, yeah. But actually, that was four. It, the play was four, The right? play was called four. Okay. It, it did happen pretty quickly. They read plays more quickly there, too. Yeah. There, in a month, I was getting... And the Royal Court did it. But even the theaters that rejected the play wrote very nice letters, and it was very encouraging, you know. You've had a career long enough now, and enough play to see your progression. Yeah. And uh, your last play, Teddy Ferrara, it's a very uh, thematic play. Why was that important for you to write, that play? There was the student at Rutgers, Tyler Clementi, who committed suicide by jumping off the George Washington Bridge. Right. With a, there was a kid with a camera in his bedroom? Right, his okay. roommate had uh, filmed him uh, in an intimate situation and others in his dorm had watched it and it had been broadcast on social media. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was a very sad yeah, no, I remember story. Why. But what I found interesting about the, the way the story was reported was that the, uh, I found that the people were portrayed as villains or victims. Uh, the roommate was a villain and, and, and Tyler Clementi was a victim. Now, uh, in a very fundamental way, that was the case. The roommate victimized him, and Tyler Clementi was a victim of this invasive and cruel act. Uh, but at the same time, I felt like the individuals themselves had a lot of complexity, and that complexity had not been communicated and articulated mm -hmm. by the, the media in the press coverage. I felt like, well, a play can be psychologically complex in the way that a news report mm -hmm. can't. So on a, on a very basic level, I was really intrigued and saddened by the event, but frustrated with the way it was covered. And what complexity did you unveil, if it's touchable? Yeah, well, you know, I think well, I was interested in, in the complexity of being gay in this moment, where on the one hand, you have so much uh, working to your advantage, and then, on the other hand, there is still real danger and difficulty. The other thing, that really interested me, and it interests me more broadly about the era that we're living in, 
is the way that so many situations in reality are perceived through the, the paradigm of victim and victimizer. It almost seems like everyone in our era feels themselves to be a victim, no matter how objectively oppressed they are or not. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's justified, sometimes it seems to me it isn't. So I was really interested in this victim psychology. What do you think that is the case in our society? Is it like we don't want to take responsibility for what we've become or the way we turned out to be, and then we have to deflate it or project my anger or frustration or love on it to someone else? There's a human impulse to scapegoat. That's yeah. clear if you just look at history. And from, you know, from the very beginning, and it's still happening today. I, I think what's interesting is wondering, well, where, what is this need to scapegoat? To say, well, you know, this person or this group is the evil, and, you know, I, I blame them. At the same time, I think there is just an existential trauma to being alive. And I feel like in our era, we don't talk about it as much. We want to find realistic reasons we suffer. Yeah. For whatever reason, our era doesn't want to take suffering on its own terms. It wants mm -hmm. to find an explanation. And so we have uh, a lot of blaming uh, and scapegoating. Now, when we said uh, you and I talking on an email, I, uh, I brought something to you and then you, get to, you got really pissed off and you said, like, oh, we're talking about spirituality. Like, people <laughs> often uh, tell you that your play don't have that, but it seems like you are circling that uh, side of spirituality. You think it's uh, the next play, you might, something you might go towards, or you feel like it's already in your place and people can't see it? I've always felt like the inner world is deep and complex. Mm -hmm. And the only thing that I want to do is, is dramatize and represent that complexity. So, you know, even if a play of mine has a, a theme or, you know, uh, seems to be exploring a particular social issue, you know, it, it really comes from very deep inside of me. And the thing I'm trying to do is represent that which is inside of me that feels most difficult to represent. Now, whether you want to call that spiritual or the inner world or the, the existential burden of, of being a human being, I think is up to you. You've had a hell of a life, you know, and you're a mom as well. How, how do you reconcile being a war photographer with a, a type of life? So I was a war photographer for four years. And of course, as things happened, I fell in love. I fell in love with my husband. And I started thinking about having kids much to my shock. Uh, I want to have about? babies yeah. with this guy. And then I thought, well, how does one shoot wars and have babies? That's a very good question. And the answer I came up with is one doesn't. Personally, <laughs> I felt that once I had given birth, it was my responsibility to do everything I could to stay alive. Listen, I loved war photography. I thought it was the most exciting job I have ever had. And at the same time, I would never go back to it because it's a young man's and a young woman's now, thank mm -hmm. God, it's a young woman's career. You have to have a lot of stamina. You have to be willing to, I remember during the Soviet coup, I didn't sleep for three days, literally did not sleep for three days. And you have to, at, at my age, I need my sleep. Yeah. I, I need coffee. Um, so I, lo I love, love photography and I actually think shooting makes you a better writer because when you're shooting history and it's chaos and it's a war, you have to choose the telling moment. And so when I'm writing, I'm often thinking, what is the photo that I would shoot of this scene that I'm describing? If you can describe a scene using a single sentence and people can see it all, that's basically the photographic version of writing and that's mm -hmm. what I try to do. So when you write a book like The Red Book, you know, how does that fit into your life now? Harvard, uh, when you graduate, they force you to write every five years a treatise, a five-paragraph treatise on your life. As we've gotten older, the entries in this red book, which is a published book that gets sent to all alumni, have become more and more honest, to the point where I just read an entry recently where somebody wrote, I'm not happy where my life has taken me, and I hope that the next part of my life will be better. So the Red Book came about because I had gone to my college 23 union and I was mm. struck by 
the difference between the narratives that I had read prior to going to the reunion in this red book, and once I got sort of in the nitty gritty with yeah. a friend who would drink a little bit and we would get, and we'd be sitting there and then you'd hear the real story of what was going on, sort of this glossy version of their life mm. was not, had nothing to do with what was really going on. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to write a novel where it starts off with these fictional red book entries, you know, the, the way that people self-report their lives. Uh -huh. You go through the re reunion weekend with them and see what's really going on. And I, clo I chose the class of 1989. My class is 88, but I chose the class of 1989 because they actually had to arrive in Cambridge in 2009 in the spring. And so they had to write their entries mm. just at the start of the recession when probably things were maybe okay for some of them. Mm -hmm. And I thought this would be a sort of perfect nexus, the 2008, 2009, where really, I mean, I, our, our, our lives changed drastically. My husband lost his sure. job in the recession, and suddenly we were moving from the Upper West Side to Harlem because we had, right. to. Yeah, had to. I couldn't believe that others weren't going through similar stories. It was really one of those like epiphany moments where once I came up on the idea, I knew exactly how the book was going to pan out. I just had to sort of figure out what the characters were. So, so you feel like in modern life, or modern America life, we present a picture of glossy picture of ourselves, and we, I suppose, there was no war conflict. It's everything is being the varnish has been removed. In America, I think Americans in general are the sort of, hey, how are you doing? Great. Everything's good. Yeah. And in France, you don't have that. You have, you know, comment ça va, bon, ça va, you know. See how possible, yeah. yeah, people are more willing to just sort of. Be true Enjoy about yourself. how they're feeling yeah. and what they're going through. So how true are these stories, uh, these entrants in this red book? I mean, every novelist hopes that what they write is true. Mm. Um, and the degree to which you succeed or not succeed at a novel is the degree to which you hit at the truth. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of this book. I think I hit at as, as much truth as I possibly could. But I think that each time you, we finish a novel, we're like, okay, I'm gonna do better next time. I'm gonna write something even more true. And I'm writing a book right now that I'm hoping is going to be even more true than, than this. You started writing at 44, you say? Oh no, I just started writing this book at 40. Oh, 40, I, 40. I'm I, sorry. At yeah. 32, I said, if I don't try it now, even though I didn't get into that classic college, who cares? I sort of quieted my inner critic, which I think is everybody has to do at a certain point. Sure. And I- If you want to survive, you have to. Yeah. You have to. And so I took a leave of absence from my job much to my husband's chagrin, because he was like, well, uh, how are we gonna pay the rent? I was like, just let me, let me try this. So I took a month, maybe two months, to write a chapter and a proposal and sold Shutter Babe for twice my Dateline salary. So then I sort of bought myself two years. That's good. And I've been writing full-time ever since. We have Alan Jacobson, if I can pick up the book. <laughs> no Way Out which follow Andrew Gross from uh, No Way Back. <laughs> so, No Way Out. Uh, is there a way out? Obviously not. Now, you and I joked yesterday about uh, the film you were writing, uh, the book about the film That's right. uh, from the That's 80s, right. uh, Roger Donaldson film. So how different is, is uh, your No Way Out? Well, you know, it's, 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 it's totally a different. It's a Karen Bell uh, It's a Karen Bell novel. Okay, so right. she's still the hero? Yes, she is. She's, she's FBI. an FBI profiler. Okay. Yeah, and she comes to London because there's a, a bombing in the a Bond Street. So she's there to do a threat assessment to determine, you know, who's behind this and, and if it, they're going to continue, you know, setting off bombs. Okay. And she finds that behind the bombing is this recently unearthed 440-year-old manuscript that holds a lot of implications for both both British and American societies. It so could she, change. Just she has access. Was it secret? Is it stored uh, somewhere? It was um, obtained by a gallery, an art gallery, and rare manuscript dealer. Okay. And he's got it. And these people who bomb the the gallery are attempting to destroy it. What was that important for you to write about? I read an article in 2006, I believe. Okay. About the concept behind this this manuscript and it intrigued me a great deal and I couldn't forget about it I, I, it just kept popping into my head periodically and I said you know when that happens someday I'm gonna have to write a book around about this. so the most true is a true story it's based on yes true it is absolutely based on okay. a lot of it is true in fact 99.9% .9 of it is true okay yep and the manuscript is where today in Oxford at the uh, and, uh, I can't library? tell you. You can't tell me? I'd have to kill you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so don't tell me. So keep uh, being elitist and keep the information to yourself. Yes. All right. Well, if you read the book, yeah, you, 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 yeah. you find out. Yeah, so you I find just out have to no buy. way out. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> What's your background, by the way? I was very intrigued by English. I got my bachelor's uh, in English, obviously. And, uh, and then I went to chiropractic school. <laughs> okay. I can, well, you see the connection, right? Yeah. <laughs> I moved to California and went to chiropractic school. And I practiced for uh, eight and a half years. I sold my practice and said, now what am I going to do with my life? And my wife said, well, why don't you go back to writing? Which, ironically, I was doing a lot of writing in practice. Because, you know, you do medical legal reports, which are is it, is different. Is it the same? Uh, you know, it's, it's nonfiction, obviously. It's processing but, information. I mean, it's yes. different brain. Yes. And there's a beginning, middle, and end to yeah, every report. Of course. A structure You're telling a story. Yeah. After I sold my practice, I was required, contractually required, to stay in the, in the office for seven months during the transition, the transition to the new yeah, doctor. During that time, a call came through from the head of the California Department of Justice asking for a reference on one of my former employees who was applying to become uh, a criminalist. And I said to him, you know, you've been, uh, let, let me ask you a question. I, I, I've got this uh, novel that I'm writing, and uh, he's a criminologist, is the main character. And I, I start describing him, and he goes, he stops me. And he goes, wait, your character's not a criminologist. He's a criminalist. And I'd never heard of that term. So he said, a criminologist studies a crime, yeah. right? A criminalist is a forensic scientist. Six months later, I call him and I say, can I come to the crime lab? Because false accusations mm -hmm. has a number of scenes that occur at a crime lab. Can I come behind the scenes at the crime lab? No, no, can't do that. Because of legal reasons. Yeah, okay. of course, yeah. But he said, come to this class on blood spatter pattern analysis. Just come. I said, okay, I'm, I'm there. So I come to this class. Where is it given? The crime lab. Okay. That's an aside. But in the class, you had homicide detectives, sheriff's deputies, uh, forensic scientists, and FBI agents. I'm in the back taking copious notes, writing every single thing, every minute, right, that the yes, instructor's because... saying. I'm soaking it in, right? And all of a sudden, I look up, and there's this huge guy standing in front of me. And uh, he says, who are you, and what are you doing? You know, because I didn't look like a cop, right? No, yeah. And I, I told him, I'm, uh, I'm writing a, a book, and I'm doing research, and I'm here, and he was on the short list for promotion to the profiling unit, behavioral analysis unit. Yeah. We struck up a friendship, which to this day, we, we talk all the time. Right? Yeah. He got promoted a few months later, invited me out to the FBI Academy, gave me a tour of the Academy, tour of the profiling unit, and that was the first of a lot of trips over the years. Why do you think crime, especially if you always show CSI and law and order, are so powerful and lasting? You think we're infatuated with crime? I think so. Is there a society that needs evil to feel better? Or? Well, if you think about it, fortunately, no, most of us... I want you to think about it, not me. <laughs> yeah, oh, no. Well, no, you think about it for a second. <laughs> crime is something that fortunately doesn't touch most of us. Yeah. You know, I'm not talking about a theft. I'm talking about violent crime, fortunately. So when we see something that happens that's unusual, that we haven't experienced, and you know, you, you're, you're being told a story around this and how the police solve. I mean, what I try to do in my novels is take the reader behind the scenes and show them something they have no way of otherwise knowing. And that's kind of what these TV series do, w whether it's true or not, uh, some of it's made yeah. up, but it gives um, a reality to it that, and it takes the, the viewer behind the scenes, just like I do in my novels. And I think that's why it's, it's long lasting. So I'm, uh, I've got a really bad neck. <laughs> <laughs> no way out, Alan Jacobson. And it seems like there is a way out after all. You, know. <laughs> you, you are the proof of it. Personal statements. Uh, that's your first book, correct? That's my first book, yeah. The first one and I got published. I forgot to tell your name. Jason Odell Williams. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Um, so how long was the process of uh, writing the book? Um, so the... Uh, um, the publishers, they approached me in the summer, June of 2012, just last okay, summer. Okay, that was a fast process. Yeah. And, and they said, do you want to write this? And I read you know, a little bit, two-page treatment they had, and I loved it. I thought it was amazing. And I said, yeah, let's do it. And it was really fast. And I wrote the first draft in, by like December, early December. Okay. And then another six months of sort of rewriting, and we published in August. So what's the story? I mean, that's about college. Uh, so a hurricane is about to hit a small coastal Connecticut town and a bunch of overachieving high school students just descend on the town, 
so they can volunteer for the hurricane, but not for humanitarian reasons. They're there so they can um, pad their college resume, write the best personal statement ever, and get into the Ivy League college of their choice. You think there's a real issue in the state with the college entrance and competition to get into college, the, uh, the Ivy League one? What's crazy is that tuitions are going up, debt is going up, but yet those sort of elite schools will, it seems to be always kind of the benchmark. Everyone will always want to get into those schools. If, even if you do the right humanitarian work and you go to Africa and fight for the AIDS orphan, that will get you somewhere these days? Even having you know, a 5.0 GPA, uh, incredible extracurriculars, but, you know, yeah. you know, being a, an intern in South Korea, uh, what all these crazy things that they do, it's still sometimes not enough. My sort of take on the whole thing, and there's a character in the book that says this, is that I think college will become less and less significant as the years go on. And I think in 50 years, they might become obsolete. Um, I think you'd have to go to college if you want a higher degree, if you're going to go to med school, law school, if you're going to be a teacher. But I think doing what I do, I don't know that I needed college. I think I could have just gone off and gone into the workforce, you know. You can learn a trade very quickly in life, you know, uh -huh. 18, 19, and be a profession by the time you're 25. But there's uh, critical thinking. This is something else to learn. And you can't learn it on your own. I think you have to be put in a place where there's a forum for it, no? But I don't know that you're learning that in college. I don't know if, I don't. I think college is supposed to teach you that. It's supposed to teach you that, right? Because the problem with yeah. critical thinking, right? High schools now, what they say the problem is is that they're just teaching to the test, right? It's all about AP exams and, and, Find a way around and it, yeah. SATs and all that stuff. And people are saying the kids in the job markets these days don't have critical thinking. And I see them. I mean, I work at a TV show and you get three or four interns and one of them gets it and the other two like really need you to hold their hand. So if you think in 50 years there will be no college, or 25 years, right, the college will be very different, should we be worried? No, I think it's a good thing. Um, I, don't th I just don't think that college has to be the end-all, be-all, has to be the destination. To me, what the purpose of college was is to kind of find yourself and find out who you are. But if it's just to get this higher degree and a piece of paper that says I went to Harvard or Yale, um, I think they've lost sight of the real reason. And our first pick for this week, pick of the week, it's a book by Molly Haskell, My Brother and My Sister. As the subtitle you can see, it's a story of transformation. Which transformation are we talking about? Well, it's a story of um, Chevy's transformation, who is uh, Molly's brother. Chevy decided at the age of 60 um, to become a woman after he was married and had kids. And the story is really written by Molly and she talks about um, her struggle to come to terms and acceptance with her brother actually wanted a different life for himself. Tremendous um, book of uh, reconciliation between brother and sister in the face of a transformation. My Brother, My Sister by Molly Haskell. The next book is a very different tone of book but the same topic about uh, queers, uh, the transvesti, gays and lesbian. Uh, it's written by Joe Wenke and it's a papal book and the book it should be really about uh, called Zen and the Art of Being a Catholic. So the Papal Bull talks about um, or questions everything about the Bible and the Catholic Church, why the new popes, or even though they are modern popes, will not accept to have um, women priests, for example. If you've been questioning your faith uh, because of your uh, sexual orientation and felt you didn't belong to the Catholic Church anymore, well, maybe this is the book for you. Uh, the Papal Bull by Joe Wink is very uh, sarcastic, caustic, uh, engaging in this questioning of the Bible and the Catholic Church. So uh, have a look at it, uh, Papal Bull and by Dr. John Wenke. Uh, the next book is a novel actually, very engaging as well, uh, by Leonel Shriver called Big Brother. And I like the design with the belt on the book, very smart. It's a story of a brother and sister, well, sister is called Pandora, and she goes to the airport to pick up her brother, and oh my God, what does she discover? That the brother is enormous, he's put like 400 pounds on since they last saw each other. She takes it home and uh, discover the roots of his uh, weight gain, that's probably deeper root than she first thought, and she actually uh, sacrifices a marriage and uh, in order to uh, save her brother. So the novel talks about really at the core uh, the sacrifice one has to do 
for to the risk your family member uh, who is obviously on the suicidal path and uh, the strong bond between family ties between brother and sister in this case uh, very engaging and also very moving what price we have to pay to do that um, Lionel Schreiber big brother and the last uh, book for the speak of the week it's a gift of adversities by um, Norman E. Rosenthal, MD. Uh, that's very important. Uh, the unexpected benefit of life difficulties, setbacks and imperfection. And its subtitle says precisely what the book is about. Now, if you have been questioning yourself and view yourself as if you do not belong anywhere, well, maybe you should read this book because this book will show you that maybe your alternative way of being and your sense of alienation plays on your favor and could be actually an asset rather than uh, difficulties. So the gift of adversity, it's a beautiful, straightforward book. The Unexpected Benefit of Life Difficulties, Setback and Imperfections by Norman E. Rosenthal, MD. And this concludes our picks of the week for this week on Alternative Voices.